We learned the hard way through the financial crisis in 08 and 09 when we didn't perform well, that we needed to be more diversified. And so uh, I do believe it's important to stay within the circle of competence, but I should have learned earlier how important it is to diversify around your core values. If you believe we can change the narrative, if you believe we can change our communities, if you believe we can change the outcomes, then we can change the world. I'm Rob Richardson. Welcome to Disruption Now. Welcome to Disruption Now. I'm your host and moderator, Rob Richardson. With me is John Rogers, who is the co-CEO of Aerial Investments, been around since 1983. He's been disrupting for a long time and uh, really in Wall Street and making sure that Wall Street and the business and the business community is more inclusive in how it invests uh, and, and making sure that it's actually living up to the statements that uh, corporate America and others say that they believe in. Uh, he's been doing it for a long time. Before it was popular, before uh, this recent year, he's been, I know that because I ran for office and it's something that he was committed to then. And it was a pleasure to get to know him then. And it's a pleasure to have him on the show. John Rogers, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's really great to be here. No, look, it's really great to have you on. And, uh, I, I want to start with uh, what I recently learned about your history with the uh, Tulsa massacre, Black Wall Street, and your and your grandfather really being a pioneer and not only being a, a business leader, but really a civil rights leader and, and really contributing to the Tulsa community. Um, and the challenges and obviously the, the things that happened there, you, you, you know it more than just being black. Every black American uh, that, knows it, that knows our history is connected to Black Wall Street in some way because we understand the tragedy of what happened there and the fact that justice still really hasn't been done uh, to this day. I would love to really just let us know about, the, tell us the story about your grandfather, his involvement in Black Wall Street and how that really shaped who you are today. Well, oh, thanks for asking. It's uh, you know it's an extraordinary history. I've been to Tulsa I think, three times now. It's for the last year and a half to two years. You know, focused on this hundredth anniversary of the you know the Wraith massacre in Tulsa. You know, my great grandfather J. B. Stratford uh, was there uh, during the boom years in Tulsa and built up the Stratford Hotel that became the largest uh, black-owned hotel in the country. Uh, it was an extraordinary success. It had you know, restaurants, bars, pool hall all these amenities that made it a very, very special place. And he was also a leader in the black community there in Tulsa, not only politically and fighting the Jim Crow laws of the day and, and, and fighting for economic justice and fairness. He was also committed to doing business with other African-Americans in every way that he could and keeping the dollars within that black Wall Street community of Greenwood. So one of the things I know that as the years have gone on, I've learned to understand that it's so important for all of us to be looking out for each other when we have these leadership roles. And as the late Congressman John Lewis told us, you know, we, we have a moral responsibility to speak up and speak out. So that was something that I think my great grandfather put into our family DNA. His son, uh, C.F. Stratford, was a pioneering lawyer here in Chicago, helped start our Black Bar Association, helped argue a case in the Supreme Court Hansberry versus Lee around the restrictive covenants here in Chicago. You know, my mom became the first black woman who graduated from the University of Chicago Law School in 1946. And uh, she often says she was inspired to go to law school because she saw her father save her grandfather's life. Hmm. By, yeah, because what happened was after the race massacre, my great grandfather, J.B. Stratford, escaped from Tulsa. He had been in, he was in the process of being indicted and being accused of helping to start the race riots, which oh, wow. of course was totally false. <laughs> okay. wow. But he was accused because he was a leader in the community. He was so right. outspoken and he made such a difference there. He escaped and went to Independence, Kansas, where he met up with his son, you know, C.F. Stratford, who um, basically, again, used his legal skills to stop Tulsa from extraditing him uh, back to Tulsa, where he possibly could have been lynched in that day. So it was, was really guaranteed to be lynched. I mean, he's a leader. And yeah, I mean, it's that's 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 really that's great that you're, that that he was able to do that. Yeah, so it was it was quite a story, and uh, so I've been really fortunate to have these pioneering parents who are outspoken and committed to economic justice and fairness in our communities. And uh, it's been a challenge from generation to generation, but I understand now uh, sort of the stock that I come from. Right. I have a couple questions there. Um, one: How did your grandfather? pass on to your father to not basically just have trauma. That's that's hard, no matter how you look at it. It's very difficult to go through what he went through. And a lot of us 
I think, uh, wanted to bury the pain and, you know, don't, didn't really like to talk about the painful things that happened during Jim Crow and pre-Jim Crow. But it seems as if your, your grandfather was able to, 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 to take something constructive out of it and not only not forget about it, but pass it on to your to, to his family and to his roots. So you, you guys would be inspired to do more and understand uh, what happened and where you came from and what you could do. Like, do you know how he went through that process of like of, of not internalizing and not becoming bitter? Because it's, it's easy. It's it's easy to do. Like, I'm not sure if I could do it. So I'm just wondering if you have any 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 um, uh, thoughts on that or just anything you can just share with us just to learn from that. Because I think it's important. Yeah, I think my quick thoughts would be that my uh, the J.B. Stratford, uh, when he got to Chicago um, and never went back to Tulsa, he tried to replicate his success here. You know, by he hoped to build out a, a major, major hotel here in Chicago. He got involved with some real estate endeavors and other small retail endeavors, but he never remotely approached the success that he had had in Tulsa. And we think he was heartbroken. Can you imagine them building something that was the largest in the nation and the black owned hotel have it totally destroyed overnight you know, with no inkling that that was going to come or that was a possibility, having to start all over in, in a new city. So it was crushing for him. But at the same time, you know, we were fortunate. Um, you know, our family had, had education and we were committed to that. You know, my father, my grandfather, my great grandfather all went to Oberlin College. Um, you know, my mom went to the University of Chicago Law School, as I mentioned earlier. So they were inspired to use their education to do really great things here in Chicago and nationally. Um, so J.B. Stratford's spirit kept our, our family going in the right direction. But I have to say, personally, my understanding from reading some of his memoirs is that it was a really, really rough go for him sure. trying to get started again. Uh, look, I'm sure. I'm sure it was. And uh, I remember you talking about this. <clears throat> the, the the land was valued at that time at two million dollars, and had he had he been able to maintain what he rightfully built, I think the projections are about a hundred million dollars that that uh, that that would be worth at this time. So it's, um, but the fact that he was able to pass pass on his his uh, entrepreneurial spirit, his skill set, um, is pretty amazing. So uh, it, it's a testament to him. It's a testament to all the things you've done as a family, because you, you, you're you definitely living on his legacy. And um, and I, I think it's important that people understand stories of resistance, too, as I, I'm going to move to a second part in a minute. But I, I will say that he was, a, at the same time, he was a businessman, but he was also an advocate. And and I, and I think there's this narrative that you have to choose your lane. If you're, if you're going to be in business, that means you can't speak up for, uh, for, for issues, that you can't fight for justice. And and the fact that he, he he combined both and that his story is told, I think is very important. The stories of resistance and entrepreneurship are not separated. You know, the two are can and should be related. So I don't know if you have any final thoughts on that. But I, I think he understood that uh, entrepreneurship was vital to our community, that we were providing jobs for each other. We were, we were, we, we were creating philanthropy in our community, supporting our churches, uh, creating political empowerment down the road. And all those things, I think, sometimes in the modern day, we've lost sight of how important it is to have strong black businesses in our community. I completely agree. We have separate conversations as we well, we got to create more businesses and uh, we have to do stuff politically and understanding that all these things are connected, you know, political activity, economic uh, growth and really supporting each other. We, I, I think we I think we're getting it back. It's it's it's, it's I think we're, we're awakening to another type of consciousness. But. Uh, we had that spirit more during Black Wall Street, and I hope that, uh, you know, from your story and others that we can learn and continue to grow. One of the things you, you, you talk about is why long-term investors and corporate leaders should address economic inequality and improving diversity as a form of risk management in terms of their strategy um, and, and how they should look towards long-term investment in doing that and why it's in their best interest long-term. Talk about the role there you see with Wall Street and investing and what role they can play and should play in closing the the, the uh, economic inequality gap in, in America, specifically with Black Americans? Well, you know, it's, it's no secret today that our economy's moved uh, in this last hundred years from kind of a construction, manufacturing-based economy to professional services, technology, and financial services community. So when you talk about Wall Street, you know, so much of the wealth today is, is in Wall Street the large private equity firms, the venture capital firms, the hedge funds, these guys are becoming billionaires and excluding us. It's just remarkable. 
you know, and, and, you, and you see that the big private equity firms control sometimes over a million jobs. Think about all the contracts and board seats they also control. It's an ecosystem that we've been pretty much locked out of. Now, after George Floyd, all of a sudden, a few doors are starting to get propped open and a couple of opportunities are coming our way. But it's just so unfortunate when you think about it, the most lucrative parts of our economy, Wall Street and Silicon Valley, broadly speaking, are the places where we're the least represented. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we just have to use our political power and our, and our civil rights leaders who are, you know, working to expose this because it's just wrong. You know, it's morally wrong. And they think things are OK. They think if they give us a donation, they yes. hire us, a few of us through an internship program. They support historically black colleges. They've checked the box. All those things are important. But if they continue to spend all their money with white law firms and accounting firms and, and uh, investment banking firms and money managers and tech firms and, and advertising agencies and all the rest, we find that our wealth gap gets larger and larger and larger as those dollars get spent with primarily white owned firms. And it just, you can't square that circle. And we have to continue to remind these guys that you can't just buy us off, you know, with that donation. It's important. You also have to include us in your economic system. So how would you, I mean, I know we can't solve this all today, but you're giving advice as just overall strategy for how we really put pressure on Wall Street. This is across the board, bipartisan, right? You go to, you go to, San, you go to San Francisco, the most progressive place uh, politically in the world, maybe, but you look at how the things you're talking about, how uh, how the contracts are given out for investments, you will see no difference. Generally, I think I would say it's pretty bold statement, but I think it's pretty. I think it's all it's very close to true. You won't see a much of a difference in terms of how they hire, how they invest in the West Coast than you will in the South or anywhere else. I mean, they they tend to is a closed loop. It seems to be in terms of getting in there, as you say. So, what pressure? can we put and how should we put that pressure on for that to happen? Because lots of people have been looking at doing this for a while um, and we made little dents and cracks, as you said, but uh, you know, it's still the, uh, the glass wall ceiling, whatever you want to call it, still seems to be maintaining itself more, more over than not. So what do you think we can do as a strategy? What should we be doing individually to put pressure on? How can we do that? Well, I think a couple of things. I think, you know, we need to continue to support our civil rights organizations. You know, Mark Morial, the Urban League, Reverend Jackson with PUSH, uh, of course, Reverend Sharpton with NAN. They deserve our dollars, our time. You know, we have to be behind them. And, and you know, Reverend Jackson worked with Black Enterprise to take their data and force Silicon Valley to, for the first time, have African-Americans on corporate boards there. You know, all yeah. of a sudden, Apple had James Bell and Hewlett Packard had four directors on two companies that they had spun out. Uh, some time ago now, all of a sudden those doors opened up for those board seats because Reverend Jackson was in there pounding away. So we need to continue to support our civil rights organizations, job one. Number two, we have to support our progressive uh, congressional leaders. You know, the folks that are in Washington making a difference. Maxine Waters is terrific. You know, Joyce Beatty is fantastic. Hakeem Jeffries. You go down the list, Robin Kelly here in Chicago, I you know, can't name them all. But we need people like that, that when these CEOs come to Washington asking for support, they're going to be asked tough questions like, how do you spend your money? I want to see transparency there. And we know that these dynamic women leaders that I mentioned are really making a difference. And of course, Hakeem has a potential someday to be speaker. Uh, and he's fantastic. Yeah. So okay. supporting these progressive political leaders. And then the questions they need to ask, and one of the things I think all the recipients of federal dollars all the recipients of uh, the stimulus dollars and this new infrastructure bill should be held accountable to have transparency in how they spend their money. And if we open up all of this data, all of a sudden, all of America can see how they let the black and brown people primarily do the catering, the construction, and the supply chain, the low margin, least wealth building parts of our economy, and all the high margin wealth parts of their economy where you know, really jobs and wealth are created today are all still going to white owned firms. We need that transparency. Yeah. And I think even Republicans can agree with transparency. We're not demanding a quota. We're just saying, show us how these dollars are being spent. If you're going to accept dollars from Washington, it just seems that that should be a, a necessary um, regulatory thing that should be there. Just the same way you have to be open and honest about how diverse your management team is and, your, and, and the folks that work in your organization if you're working with the government. Yeah, I mean, as, uh, as I want to I get more to the point about 
uh, how corporate America should be spending and really spend some time in that. But before I get there, really just pointing out, uh, you know, something that uh, Ariel has pointed out in, in, in his report that, um, you know, this is uh, investing in diversity, like you said, is not a, it's the right thing to do, but it's also the uh, economically uh, advantageous thing to do. It, you know, long term, it, you've seen, you, you outperform uh, most firms who are your peers too. Uh, and when you have diverse team, guess what? They have different perspectives and, and they bring uh, more opportunities, more money. Uh, third, you know, the world is becoming, is more diverse and the opportunity and growth is happening in diverse areas, happening in Africa, happening in, 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 in other countries. The growth areas, the growth opportunities are in these areas. So having people that have a diverse perspective and can help you penetrate that market seems like it would make sense uh, for you to grow. So it's not just something like, this is not charity. This is actually doing what's in the best interest for America uh, and, and for long-term growth. So I think it's really important as we talk about closing, closing the, 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 the gap, the wealth gap is in the best interest of everybody. It's in the best interest of white Americans too. Uh, when you look at the South, the South with the Jim, with Jim Crow, it was there for years when Jim Crow was there, the South was depressed economically. And guess what? When that turned around and you didn't have Jim Crow as much, uh, then you had the, you had you had the South turn around and create more opportunity. For a long time, they were trailing. It's because when you have uh, a, an economy that doesn't provide as many opportunities for people, it may, it provides less opportunities for everybody. So this is try to get people to see that this is not like a zero sum game. Like this, if you invest in if you invest in black founders, you, if you invest in uh, black wealth managers, that's not taking away necessarily from others. Is it's expanding the pie and growing the pie. But we have to get that out there because the frame is always, well, you're doing this and that means less is coming to me, which has actually never been shown to be true. So I just, I think it's very important that you, that Ariel's been focused on that. And I wanted to just make that final point before we move on to our next point. You talk about, uh, Ariel has had a lot of focus let's, let, about really changing the narrative from supplier diversity to business diversity. And you, you, you talked about it a little bit earlier, but I wanna deep dive into that a little bit more about why that terminology is important and, 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 and what we should do to really guide the conversation. Now that we we have the attention, I would say, of corporate America, white America in general, more than we ever have, I will say, in my lifetime, at least. Uh, we we might have had it in the 60s during some point. Uh, but this, I think, the you know, George Floyd and just the protest and just the pandemic of the moment definitely, um, I think, created a consciousness uh, among others that we haven't seen and I haven't seen in my lifetime. And I wanna talk about what we do with corporate America. You talk specifically about changing the narrative from supplier diversity to business diversity. Why is that important and what does that mean to you? Well, I, I say to start off and say, you know, I, I think it's kind of like supplier diversity is kind of like blockbuster video compared to Netflix, you know, or Blackberry versus the Apple iPhone. Um, it's so out of date. Our economy, as I said earlier, has become a professional services, financial services, and technology-based economy. And actually, we have this data now. We came out from McKinsey and BCG in work that was done for our uh, Chicago Business Leadership Group, the Civic Committee, that says, basically, if you look at the 14 sectors of how money is spent in Chicagoland, number one, it's professional and business services at $85 billion in spend, profit margin 5 to 20%. Uh, Number four, finance and insurance, 70, basically $75 billion, similar profit margin. You go down to number 10 to get to construction, you know, yeah. roughly $25 billion, a third, I mean, really, you know, a third of those other categories and profit margins, zero to 0.5%, very mm -hmm. low profit margin. So if you want to create wealth in your economy, you've got to create it in the parts of the spin where the wealth's created, where the margin is. And we just sort of fell into this trap that everything's around construction and if you think about Chicago, you think of our biggest buildings, you know, the Aon Center is an insurance brokerage business, the Willis Tower, which was the Sears Tower, insurance and consulting, Hancock Building, insurance, J.P. Morgan Chase Building, banking. There's not a construction or a catering headquarters there. And if you look at the 84 largest businesses in Chicago, none of them are in construction. They're all in these professional financial services, not all, but the majority of them are in professional and financial services. So that's why this term business diversity is, is a greater, is a really great solution to this uh, branding and uh, communication issue. And the University of Chicago came up with it. 
they had gone from zero uh, work, uh, working with minority owned businesses 12 years ago to now working with 95 professional services and technology based businesses at the University of Chicago. And they coined the term business diversity to be able to signal to the marketplace that the University of Chicago is open for business in everything they do on all dollars that are spent. And we just think that that is what we have to do if we want to really build wealth in our, in our, our economy. So this term business diversity, I can't say how, how important it is. It's starting to catch on around the country. It's starting yeah. to catch on here in Chicago in particular. And I think Nadia Quarles, who works closely with President Bob Zimmer at the University of Chicago to have draw, have drove this uh, language change that is really important. Other part of that is everyone talks about the importance of access to capital. What the University of Chicago has also proven is it's important to have access to customers. Oh, you know, that's good. Access to capital, access to customers is really important. That's a great point. Right. And um, I tell people access all the time. Access to customers leads to more access to capital by, by, by logic. Exactly. You know, McDonald's, where I'm on the board, has done the best job over a genera- couple of generations, actually. Maybe it's been three generations of building multi-generational wealth by agreeing to work with Black-owned suppliers. Often they took a Black leader from the corporate community like Mike Thompson, uh, Bob Beavers, and put them in business, uh, first partnering with a majority-owned firm and eventually taking over ownership and leadership. And once you had a contract to supply croutons or ice cream toppings or sausages to McDonald's, you had no trouble getting capital to build your business and grow your business. Exactly. You know, so there's these multi-generational wealth that's been created by these large companies that are McDonald's suppliers. Five of the top 20 companies in the Black Enterprise Top 100 list are McDonald's suppliers. Wow. You know. Wow. I mean that's that that's you you really said a lot there. I I've had some experience in politics. Obviously, I, I ran for mayor of the city of Cincinnati as well, um, and 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 I know a lot about the internal kind of supplier diversity. I'm going to call it a game. Uh, right. That's what it is. It, most of it's a game. Most of it's a facade, uh, and, and it does focus on construction uh, a lot. And I think that's and it, it's it's just a way of playing a shell game, and 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 oftentimes. Uh, I don't know how it is in Chicago, but I can definitely speak for uh, Cincinnati. Even these firms that get this work, they still don't get to the point where they have enough real access to customers where they can uh, bid on the work themselves as just an outright entity because they don't have enough capital, customers, so on and so forth. Uh, so these things, they, what they end up doing is they get some subcontract with a contractor every now and then. Uh, sometimes they just partner with somebody else and they're not really, they don't really have a business that they've grown. Um, and so that game is continually played. So even in the even in that small, like you said, that you talk about the profit margin is already small in construction. It's when the it's even smaller and smaller when you look at you know mm-hmm. African Americans that are getting what piece they get. They get the 0.5 piece of the 0.5 percent profit margin. <laughs> so it's even it's even really really low when you're looking at that. And there's no uh, and even when they look at these big development projects, right? There's there's no conversation about who's the architect. Right. Who's the who are the accountants on the job, even within the construction industry? When you mm-hmm. talk about these jobs, like a lot of the opportunities come through professional services within the construction jobs. But everybody likes to look at, OK, we hire there's one contractor. We can point to our numbers and check a box versus actually doing something that's going to uh, actually build and have and have a strategy that actually works. So I'm all for what you guys are saying. And I hope Cincinnati is listening. Frankly, the University of Cincinnati, I mean, all the all these institutions, uh, I don't want to hear their diversity statements anymore. Let me see what your business diversity. You don't have to tell me Black Lives Matter because I really, I mean, okay, uh, I really want to see what you do in your spin and what your policies are for your spin and show me something. Like I don't really care about their diversity statements and what. The, I, that's my opinion. I don't know. Maybe I'm off on that. What do you think? No, you're you're exactly right. And the universities in our major cities are the worst actors. You know, again, here in Chicago, University of Chicago is fantastic. But DePaul, Loyola, Roosevelt, Columbia, IIT basically only work with white firms for who manages their endowment. Again, who does their legal work, who does their consulting, et cetera, et cetera. Who does their advertising, their public relations, their government affairs. Vast majority of it is white-owned businesses. And we just sort of sat in these boardrooms and let us do this. So they let us serve on the boards for free. You know, to diversify their board, yep. they let us in the schools to you know, diversify the student body. But then they, when it comes to like who gets the economic opportunity, that goes to the friends of the white trustees who understand uh, how to work the system yep. uh, on their behalf. 
Well, they grandfather it in. My, you know, my mother, who's owned several businesses, has said this, like, well, we have some grandfather clauses in. They build it in a way like, oh, you had to have worked with the this amount of X universities for this amount of years. And my, 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 my mother says what you said. Well, my grandfather <laughs> was in Jim Crow. My great grandfather was a slave. So I'm always going to be grandfathered out unless you guys right. say your right. coach. <laughs> I mean, like, and that's what it is, right? Because they set up the, and I've done it. I've applied for it. Most of the time, it's a waste of time. I have an ad agency as well. It's RFP that if you set up for the RFP, you have to already proven that you worked with this exact entity or entity just like that for three or four years. And you generally don't have that opportunity, so you can never prove that. Even if you work with similar clients, or you've done, or you, or you've shown that you have the ability. So you're right. There has to definitely be a reckoning at this moment. I really like a, a as we as we talk about what's happening in this moment, we have to have. I think Roland Martin said it's like a third reconstruction to have our approach be much more strategic, much more comprehensive, and not just settle for the corporate diversity statements or the. Somebody, somebody gets hired as DNI. I'm not downing DNI and what they do, mm-hmm. diversity and inclusion. But generally, they're not given any power to do anything. And so, I don't really care if they have a head of diversity and inclusion. I care about what their numbers are for spending. So we have to definitely change our expectations, change our narrative, as you said. And, and I love what Ariel is doing for that. And uh, I definitely say keep that up. Thank you. It's great talking with you. We have to talk about the fact that when you took on Michael Jordan. And he, <laughs> Michael Jordan in one on one. Oh, I've had so much fun with the story, uh, but it, you know it happened at his fantasy camp. He used to have what they call the senior flight school, and you know you go there, and it's, you'd be thirty five years and older. And they're the greatest coaches in the country, you know, from John Thompson to Coach K to all the world class coaches, and you'd be on a team for four days and play for a championship at the camp. But one day at the camp, he would challenge any camper to a short game of one on one. And the first seven years of the camp, no one ever beat him. And um, so I decided I would try it. It was my last year at the camp. And uh, he played about 15 campers that day. So I think he was kind of tired. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, he never lost. He'd let you make a basket or two. Then he would clamp down. And, you know, he always won. So uh, my old coach at Princeton, Pete Carrill, always said, you know, you're legally blind when it comes to passing, but you're a good one-on-one player. And so I just got very fortunate. I made a couple of my sort of trick shots that I have in my arsenal. And the fun part is that when the last shot goes in, you can hear Michael say, oh, no. I saw it. I want to play that clear. Oh, no, no. It's like, <laughs> I know. So it's been wonderful. Sports Illustrated has done a couple of features, and we've had some, you know, good good press and notice, and people stop me on the street and say, you're that guy, you know. <laughs> it's- I've seen it. It's definitely been a clip. I've seen it on YouTube, man. You became famous on YouTube. Like my son saw like, you know, this guy, he beat Michael Jordan. I'm like, <laughs> I know him. I know him. I didn't know he could hoop. I did, I did not know that. You would have yeah. one on one. I didn't know you could hoop like that. Oh, I was gonna get you get a break once in a while in life. And I understand if I played him a hundred times, he would beat me hundred next hundred hundred next times for sure. You only need to beat him once though. You beat you beat Michael Jordan. <laughs> you can use that for the rest of your life. It's something you could say, you definitely beat Michael right. Jordan. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. So <laughs> all right, I have a final question for you. What I like to ask a couple of rapid fire questions. I'm gonna ask one because some of them I uh two actually, because I asked most of them earlier. Um, what advice would you give your younger self and what advice would you ignore? You know, it's, uh, I think that there's two edges, two edges of that coin. I think that in the beginning, um, we've been in business 38 years and I believe that focus, 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 you know, be the best small and mid cap value money manager, mutual fund manager in the country. And you would perform well by being really, really focused. We learned the hard way through the financial crisis in 08 and 09 when we didn't perform well, that we needed to be more diversified. And so uh, I do believe it's important to stay within your circle of competence, but I should have learned earlier how important it is to diversify around your core values and make sure that you don't have all your eggs in one basket because it was pretty devastating during that last financial crisis and we almost didn't make it through. Wow. And so that's probably been the, the biggest lesson of what I should have known earlier is, you know, diversify and, and not believe in that concept that that was that you should always be totally focused. Yeah. Uh, final question. You have a committee of three that can be living, they can be dead to advise you on business strategy and life. Who are the three people and why? Wow. That's, that's, that's not a fair question. Um, it never is. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 you know, clearly um, I, you know, I revere, you know, Dr. King and his leadership and his courage and 
fighting for us and sacrificing so much for us. And as I've you know, gotten to know Andy Young and Reverend, Reverend Jackson quite well and people who were so close to him and to see his commitment, I would love to have him as one of the three. Uh, that's, that's, that's for sure. Um, you know, Warren Buffett is the greatest investor of all time. And, yeah. um, you know, he's just someone who, uh, you know, if you're triggering an investment business, there's no doubt that like, people wonder whether, you know, was LeBron James better than Michael Jordan? Maybe, maybe not. You know, I'm a Jordan fan, but there's no doubt that Warren Buffett's the greatest investor of all time. So I would look to him for leadership. And then finally, from a, you know, a black entrepreneurship standpoint, here in Chicago, we had these giants, George Johnson with Afrosheen and Ultrasheen, John Johnson with Ebony and Jet. George Johnson's become my personal hero. You know, he had the first black owned company on the stock exchange and American stock exchange. He created so much philanthropy for our community. Uh, he, he, he helped start soul train Don Cornelius. He started the largest black bank in the country, independence bank. He was the largest advertiser in essence when they desperately needed advertising. He was a one person ecosystem that brought wealth and opportunity to the black community and then supported our causes and our civil rights leaders and political leaders. So my, my, my three would be Dr. King, George Johnson from Johnson Products, and Warren Buffett you know, from Berkshire Hathaway. Those would be the three. Those are good choices. John Rogers, co-CEO of Aerial Investments. Uh, pleasure having you on. Look forward to working with you more in the future. Thank you. Anytime. It's a terrific interview. Yes. Thank you so much.